Welcome to 12 Week Relationships. This is your place for better relationships in weeks, not years. My name is Pi. Welcome back to another Roadmap episode. This is an accompaniment to the TWR newsletter, which we call the 12 Week Relationship Roadmap. You can sign up for the newsletter at 12weekrelationships.com and it's available to you when we write out this handwritten message. It'll come to your inbox each week. You can either read the message or you can click and listen to it or watch via podcast form. So this is our roadmap uh, on the conversation of the one relationship question that nobody could answer. And if you remember our last episode, you might actually remember the question. I'm going to say this too, by the way, <laughs> I'm not really a fan of small talk. I think the uh, most uncomfortable thing for me is actually being asked to mingle at a cocktail party, despite being able to appear extroverted. I am not, I am very introverted and it draws a lot of energy from me to go around and to have these little conversations that ultimately to me are quite meaningless. So it's funny because in the podcast, in our newsletter, in everything that we do, I, I find that I just really enjoy getting into the meat of the conversation. I enjoy getting straight to the value and again, the what's in it for you. So in this episode, I, I want to get into that question of what does a healthy relationship look like? And I'm going to start by asking you that question. I want you to actually think about it. So here it is, romantic or platonic. I don't care of what relationship you want to think about. I just want you to tell me what does a healthy long-term relationship look like? I'll give you a minute. Not really a minute. I'll give you a couple seconds. <laughs> it's kind of a frustratingly simple question, right? I mean, your mind probably went to some of the things that we might hear. We might hear things like relationships are all about loyalty. But the problem is that each one of these oversimplifications, we can kind of break down and disprove very quickly. Well, relationships can't be all about loyalty because what happens when the other person in that relationship is making bad decisions, decisions that could potentially negatively affect you? Are you supposed to be loyal even though they're choosing things that could harm you? Well, what about when the other person has already betrayed you? Are you supposed to be loyal in that case because they've already done this thing? So you could say that loyalty is an important aspect of relationships, that trust needs to be there, but could we say that it's all about that thing? Well, what about communication is the key to a healthy marriage or to a healthy relationship? Okay, I actually had a counselor say this exact phrase to me, and this was unbeknownst to him. This came at the time that I was really starting to dive deep into the research and to be doing all these things. And, and my own marriage was going south. And, and I asked him the question, just tell me, what does a healthy relationship look like? And he goes, you know, it's all about communication. This is a, a licensed counselor, by the way. Like these are either people that hold master's degrees or they hold doctorate degrees. He was a, a licensed LMFT. And I immediately said, that's bullshit. I'm, I'm actually going to call you on that because are you telling me that, you know, within, let's say a marriage, for example, that, you know, intimacy, physical intimacy, sex can be not there, non-existent, that we can have nothing in common. There is no relatability. I was even starting to use words from the framework that was being developed. We don't find each other relatable in any way. We don't have any common interests. We don't, we don't change or grow together. We're just two people living, you're, you're saying that for these two roommates that are in the same home, that communication is everything. I mean, if we could communicate perfectly and we had none of those things, would you say that this is a successful marriage or that it would succeed? And he immediately paused and was like, well, um, I'm not really sure how to you know, answer that question. Okay. We hear things like good friends don't fight or argue. Well, that's complete garbage because it's those healthy arguments and those fights that good friends have that actually enable uh, them to have the ability to resolve conflict that actually give them the ability to say, Hey, if we've been through this, we can get through anything. So the actual opposite is true that it's likely that if you're very good friends with someone that 
you're okay to handle conflict, that you're okay to resolve conflict and you've done it before. Marriage is about compromise. <laughs> these are these are funny to me because I can think back to all these different experiences. This one with a, uh, and I'm talking about my personal experiences because we have so many client and case studies, but I feel like I can give you a little bit more of the story when it's my personal experience because it's not, you know, something that uh, I can give you the details. Whereas when it comes to any one of our clients, any of our case studies, any of our uh, listeners, I, I want to keep things fully anonymous. I want to keep the details completely fictitious so that nothing can actually be traced back. But for me personally, I, I remember sitting across from an ecclesiastical leader. Uh, if you grew up within the LDS church, uh, we have what's called a, a bishop. A bishop is a person that is kind of in charge of a congregation. You can think of them as like the presiding priest or like the father or whatever they might be, that that presiding person in a, in a congregation. And, and they often are in a position where they're giving marital advice. They really shouldn't be. Uh, I don't know if it's, I don't believe it is actually anything official. It's just the fact that in the nature of, you know, them being a confidant to that entire congregation has them often sitting on the other side of hearing these issues. And so I'm meeting with a bishop and I say, I, I just like, honestly, I just tell me what does, you know, your relationship look like? What does, it seems like you guys have something healthy. What does that look like? What, what it does a healthy relationship look like? And as I'm stumbling through this, he he goes, uh, marriage is all about compromise. And, you know, at, at different points in my life, I either had the ability and confidence to question things or I didn't. At that time, I didn't have the ability to question it. I only was trying to gather data. And so I took what he was saying as, as okay, marriage is all about compromise. It was only several years later when I would think about that that it would not make sense at all because how can marriage be all about compromise? What, what compromise really is, is neither person getting what they want. I mean, in business compromise is not necessarily a good thing. We have entire books that are devoted toward, you know, when you come to the table, you should negotiate a deal that is for both sides beneficial. It is not a compromise. The, the, the idea of compromise is not a thing that should be the goal. So to say that a marriage is all about compromise, it's all about really, you know, neither person getting what they want and just meeting in the middle, that's not sustainable. There might be certain areas where compromise is an important thing, but there also should be certain areas that are uncompromisable that, that the, you stick to, especially when it comes to the aspects of mental health and all of that. But I didn't have the ability to be able to understand that or to question it at the time. So I took that as a very literal piece of advice that I, that I followed and I would compromise everything that I would want and need to be able to sustain a relationship with someone who made no compromises, at least from my viewpoint, what I share is my experiences and I, and I want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear on that. But if you are in a narcissistic relationship, uh, which that is where I was, if you're a people pleaser, me in a narcissistic relationship and someone tells you the advice like marriage is about compromise, what is the people pleaser going to do? Well, if you believe that advice, you're going to go and do it and you're going to give up all the things that you want, the things that would sustain you to be able to feed the narcissist who is going to have no real idea or vision of what they're even doing. Sometimes, most of the time, depends. <laughs> But regardless, marriage can't be just about compromise. How about friends are in your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime? I remember hearing this from a friend of mine who was using the phrase to explain why her romantic relationships and why her friendships often ended. And I thought it so odd. And at that time, I, I was questioning things. I had the knowledge. I had the ability to say, hey, hold on there. When you say that, that kind of dismisses, you know, your own ownership in why these relationships are ending. When, when most of your friendships and most of your romantic relationships end and you have very few long-term relationships that you can lean on, you have to start asking yourself why 
friends are in your life for a reason, a season or a lifetime that just dismisses it. It kind of, it kind of says that all of this is just up to the universe when it's really not. If it's up to the universe, you have no power to control it. But if you do have some ability, some power, then you should be asking, what is the reason? What is the season? You know, what makes it a lifetime? Couples should never go to bed angry. That's a dangerous one. You, you'll hear this one oftentimes at toasts and speeches at wedding receptions. One of the most common things, right? Um, heard this one so many, I, I heard all of these so many times at a, at a wedding toast and a reception, but this one is by far the most popular one. Don't go to bed angry. I'm going to go into that one in just a second. And, and the thing is that I could keep going on and on with these common pieces of relationship advice. I don't even want to call them advice. I, I don't want to give them that stature, that, that status, because they're not. These are statements, inaccurate statements based off of anecdotal experience, off of an individual's experience. And if I'm honest, the thing is that we've all heard, we've all believed, we've all even shared our fair share of this kind of bad relationship advice, these statements. And they all sound the same. They sound profound, but they offer little to no actionable guidance. And they have no semblance whatsoever of an actual framework or structure either. But the worst part about each of these is usually these things roll off our backs. A friend says it, someone says it, and usually it's just like, yeah, whatever. You know, it just kind of goes back into our, the back of our minds as, you know, this is one piece of what a relationship might be. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they actually go to the forefront of our minds because we believe them. Not necessarily the statement. We believe the person that said the statement. And this is where they can be incredibly damaging. And this is where I would go to the couples should never go to bed angry. This is one that is so widely shared that we will see clients come to us and they will talk about it. Like, you know, we were always counseled to never go to bed angry. And well, this one night we had a big fight and I went to bed and now I'm just questioning everything about our marriage. They believe in this sentiment so strongly that because of one instance of going to bed angry, they're questioning their entire relationship and the validity and the structure and the foundation and all of it. And this hasn't happened just one time. It's happened many, many times. In fact, in my own marriage, I would say that I too had that belief early on in my marriage, you know, a couple years into it, as we are fighting, as we're having issues. And, and I keep hearing this line in church said over and over, over, never go to bed angry. And I'm going to bed angry. Well, does this call into question my entire marriage? Is, there, is it this? Is it that? I mean, in my case, I was in an unhealthy marriage. So in what cases is this right? And in what cases is it wrong? How does this fit into any sort of like kind of puzzle? Well, it really doesn't. And the answer to that would be this. If we expect a marriage to last a lifetime, and we know that our mornings are often filled with busyness. We have to get up early, prepare for work, prepare for school. If we have kids, we got to get them ready. We're getting up at, you know, five, six, seven a.m. to go and do these things. And if you have an argument the night before when you're exhausted, what is the likelihood that the following day you have to wake up early <laughs> across a lifetime? The likelihood's pretty high. And across a lifetime, what is the likelihood that you get into a fight? And if you actually believe in this sentiment, how is it realistic that you never go to bed angry? Because if you do get into a fight, and this is at the end of the day when you're both emotionally drained and you're tired, going, to about, going into resolving that issue then is often going to lead to more issues. You're going to say things you didn't want to say. You're going to do things you didn't want to do, all because you're tired, you're exhausted, and you're thinking about everything you have to do the next day. And in a lifetime of these mornings, these busy mornings, it is completely unrealistic to expect that every night you can go to bed completely happy. Now we can be angry and resolve to say, you know, 
Let's talk about this tomorrow. You don't have to go to bed upset and fighting. But in most of these cases, the most healthy thing is to actually save the conversation for when you have the time and the energy to discuss it and to go to bed, to put yourself in the headspace, the mind space, where you're healthy enough to have the conversation in the first place. But instead, we see one couple after the next come in, talk about how they tried to resolve it before going to bed because they believe that they should never go to bed angry. And guess what? They make the problem worse. Then they start questioning the entire marriage. And in some cases, the marriage should be questioned. In other cases, it's a completely healthy marriage. But the point is, is it has nothing to do with going to bed angry. So what does a healthy relationship look like? I don't expect you to have an answer to this. Um, I'm reiterating this point because there's a simple truth. Most of the meaning in our lives, and I say most because I don't want you guys to argue with me that, oh, it's only part of this. I really want to say all the meaning, but I'm just going to say most. I'm going to leave some room there. Most of the meaning in our lives stems from our relationships, from the experiences that we get to share with the people that we love, that we care about, that we want to spend time with, from our friends to our family, everything. So if we can agree that most, a lot, a significant portion, you don't have to say all, but if we can agree that a good portion of our significance, about meaning, comes from our relationships, then why can none of us answer such a basic question as what does a healthy long-term relationship look like? Again, this isn't to berate you and it's not to make you feel bad because I was in the exact same boat. Dr. Glenn is in the exact same boat. I want to, I want to, focus on this. And I want you to realize this because there is something more insane than that. There is something more insane than acknowledging that we derive most of the meaning in our lives from our relationships, yet we have no idea how they operate. As insane as that sounds, there's something crazier. The fact that we've asked multiple professionals, well over 30 professionals, the exact same question. I'm talking counselors, psychotherapists, people that hold master's degrees, doctor degrees, relationship experts, coaches, ecclesiastical leaders, LMFTs. I mean, I mean, you name it. We've asked before we did the actual research, we asked well over 30. I lost count of exactly how many, the exact same question. And none of them had an answer that was better than any of the things that we've discussed so far. Their answers were the same. They were don't get me wrong. They, they sounded better when they gave their responses, right? You know, when my marital therapist said that relationships are about compromise, I mean, sure. He, he, he was able to talk about the balance and the, the, you know, the dynamic and, you know, this would be, it sounded eloquent, but at the end of the day, it's the exact same thing. I don't care if you say, okay, you know, between two people, Person A is going to want one thing and person B is going to want another. And their ability to basically align their goals, to align their values resides in having the know-how to communicate through those problems. <laughs> that, that sounds great. Sounds fantastic. You literally said the exact same thing. Marriage is about communication. Relationships are about communication. So that's what I mean is when, when distilled, their answers were no different than the vague and unactionable cliche that we would willingly give to each other, that friends give to each other, that family shares with each other. And when we press them, none of them could answer the basic question when they were challenged. And when we said, no, that, that can't be it, that that can't be the only thing. What does a healthy relationship look like? What are the pieces? Oh, well, it's complicated. Okay. Well, break it down. Oh, well, there's lots of moving parts. Okay. What are those moving parts? Nobody could get to that place because it was never a concern or a priority for the science, for academia to actually address that issue. Instead, we focused in on why do people fight? We focus in on what's the best way to communicate. We focus in on symptomatic issues. Why? Because the entire medical model is a symptomatic model, at least from a westernized or Western medicine standpoint. And when we say, you'll hear Dr. Glenn talking often about the medical model of treatment, right? The medical model of treatment 
is let's say that you let's say you have knee pain you go and you see your doctor and what's most likely to happen is that the doctor says oh you have knee pain okay uh here are some anti-inflammatories go ahead and take these and you know the problem should go away well the symptoms will go away you take the painkillers and the symptom will go away you might also have you know other outside issues that happen because of those painkillers but whatever let's not talk about the 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 other you know things that come about but the underlying issue was never resolved we took the painkiller to 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 resolve the knee pain problem is when we stop taking the painkiller that the knee pain comes back because what was actually necessary was for the doctor to say look uh, you have knee pain. Let's try and figure out why. Oh, you had a sports injury. Okay. So what I'm going to do is going to give you this anti-inflammatory and I want you to go and see a physical therapist who focuses on sports injuries. What we need to do is actually rebuild the muscle around the knee joint because there's an imbalance in the way that you're walking right now. And so that problem is going to keep reoccurring. Medicine is getting better. And these days it is more and more likely that your doctor will give you an actual treatment plan to resolve the immediate issue and to actually address the underlying problem. But I'll tell you 20 years ago, when my dad was going through anxiety and all these different things that he was, these mental health issues, and and still this is quite common today. When my dad was going through those things and he went to his doctor, his doctor prescribed him with medication and then said, just avoid situations that cause you stress and anxiety. How is that appropriate advice? I mean, are you supposed to become a hermit? Because my dad actually believed this doctor and he did. My dad chose to stay home to avoid the people in his life that were causing stress. Now that that is everybody, right? Because if a lot of these root issues are your own, it doesn't matter what I say or what anyone else says. It doesn't matter. in, In most cases, it's not even anybody doing anything wrong. It's the perception that he would have. And he would also avoid the actual stressful situations, the the places where that anxiety was being created, the workplace where, you know, he was being mistreated and all these different things. And so he became a, I mean, he would just became a homebody. And guess what happens to that anxiety, that stress? Well, it gets worse over time, right? Because like any muscle that doesn't get exercised, you begin to atrophy. So his ability to actually handle stress and to actually handle those situations got worse over time. So what does the doctor do? Take more drugs. Yeah, we need to up your dose to this amount now because, well, your stress is coming back again. This is no different than Dr. Glenn's experience, which was actually pretty recent. This still happens all the time. Dr. Glenn is working with a psychotherapist. And we talked about this in the podcast when Dr. Glenn got his brain scan after he left that traumatic experience in social work and gave up his license and, and separated from that whole thing. His psychotherapist said, you have the brain of someone that has been to war. The amount of trauma that you have suffered is worse than a soldier going to war. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to treat this. And at best, you just need to remove and reduce all the stress in your life. You can't handle things anymore. Fortunately, Dr. Glenn knew enough at that time to challenge it. But in so many cases, we don't. We don't challenge it. And this is where bad advice can be so incredibly dangerous. Because when you believe the person that's giving you that advice, you don't question it and you implement it. And it's very likely that if that advice was bad, it's going to take you to an even worse place. This is the the medical model. The medical model is to treat you and to keep you within a sort of, I want to say like a median level of comfort, not supposed to medical model treatment is not supposed to be too extreme on either side. And it applies to psychotherapies as well. If you're in an unhealthy relationship, an unhealthy marriage, the medical model of intervention would give you coping skills. Well, this is how you deal with that. Let's talk about this. Let's deal with the symptoms. This is, uh, you know, Okay, so he's saying these things and, and this is that that's kind of like emotionally abusive. So in those moments, I want you to I want you to separate yourself from what's being said. And I want you to, you know, think that they're not trying to hurt you in that way. And just go to your room upstairs and 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 separate from it. Now, 
what the medical model should be doing is saying, no, you're in an unhealthy marriage. You're in an unhealthy relationship. And it doesn't matter what coping skills I give you. It doesn't matter how I help you to treat the pain of it. The underlying root problem is going to always be there. But the medical model says that this intervention shouldn't be extreme. See, for me to give you the appropriate advice, it would be you're in an unhealthy relationship. If that relationship can't be changed, if it can't be improved, if both people aren't willing to come to the table, then it's never going to change. And your healthy option would be to exit. But that would require an extreme change on your part. That'd require you to go through some difficult things to get to the other side, which would, of course, be better. So I can't do that. In the medical model, I can't give you that treatment plan. I can't, I can't give you any opinions. I can't give you anything that would be extreme on either side. I can only give you coping mechanisms. I can only deal with the symptoms that are in front of me. So that's what we get. This is what we get in our professionals. This is what we get in our experts. This is why the model is broken. We get painkillers when in reality we need the painkiller temporarily to help us stop the pain and then we need physical therapy just like a trauma surgeon would need to stop the bleeding before they would go in and actually fix the root issue we have to stop the bleeding and then we have to fix the root issue it's not just about stopping the bleeding it's not just about killing the pain but this is why the traditional model is broken now this this is the funny part is because Dr. Glenn and I I had already, you know, asked this question of 30 plus professionals and then I gave Dr. Glenn the exact same challenge and I actually asked him the exact same question when I presented him with the book and he couldn't answer it himself. And I said I want you to start asking the people around you this question. So he did. And uh nobody could answer. It. I mean we we'd asked well over 30 people. Like I said I I lost count of the number. It wasn't important. But what we both knew was that nobody could answer this fundamental question. Nobody that was an expert could answer this fundamental question, which meant that the rest of us, you know, the rest of us people that are just laymans that are just trying to figure out what it is that we should do, we're all screwed. Because what's the likelihood that we're going to have the answer when the professionals can't even figure it out? But at the same time, we're gaslighting ourselves. Dr. Glenn and I are sitting there gaslighting ourselves thinking, well, maybe we're asking the wrong people. Maybe, um, you know, we need to go and expand and, and get a larger statistical grouping. Maybe we need to do a research project. And that's what we ended up on instead of just asking more people and, and ending up with the exact same. And we'd, we'd found some articles before, you know, we kind of found some places that were published, but not enough. <laughs> and it wasn't enough that we saw it ourselves and had our own experience. We needed more. We were literally convincing ourselves that maybe we're wrong. So we began a three month long academic research project and we brought in one of Dr. Glenn's peers who's not involved with, you know, 12 week relationships and this platform that we've created because we didn't want any bias. And all we asked the peer to do was to spend time and pull academic research and prove whether traditional counseling is effective or not effective. So three months later we sit down and our peer, Dr. Glenn's associate, she had 75 academic journals. And what she proved was that we were wrong. We just didn't know how wrong. Or you could say we were right. We just didn't know how right. See, Dr. Glenn and I thought that traditional counseling was ineffective. What we were thinking was that it didn't work, you know, half the time. What we found was that we were wrong. It is ineffective, but the number was closer to 80 to 90% ineffective. And this is where Dr. Glenn and I were blown away. We were wrong in how badly we had underestimated the scope of what was happening. That it was not just ineffective that, I mean, it, it's, it's really quite tragic to be honest. Because most of the research, most of the time, most of the money, it's spent on marital therapy, marital counseling, research, data in these aspects, right? But that's one of, granted, the most significant relationships in your life, but that's only one of those relationships when you have family relationships that are significant, children, 
friends, coworkers, business partners. In a lifetime of relationships, your marriage is one of your significant relationships. 90% of our data of our research is going to studying this subject, marriage. And we are 10 to 20% effective in our solution of improving it. And this is when we began to see, okay, not only do we need what we have in terms of this new product, this new, this new service in 12 week relationships and core value focused therapy and this underlying model, the SSRM, the stupid, simple relationship method. But we need to start applying that and showing people how it works in everyday relationships and in relationships outside of romance and marriage. It also brought the painful reality into view of not only just how bad and how inaccurate these services were, but just how the most damaging advice was coming from the professionals, from the people that you would assume that you could trust. See, what these academic journals also cited was that despite their education, their experience, if you go and you get an LMFT or you go and you get some sort of certification to be a counselor, to be a psychotherapist, to be whatever it might be, right, that that person is going to take what they've learned and they're going to apply it based around their own life experiences. And that's the way that they're going to share it with someone else. Because without a framework to use that knowledge, without, without a structure of how relationships operate, all we can do individually is take what we've learned and apply it to what we know. Because we don't have an existing framework to apply all this knowledge to. So it's not to say that the academics, the research, the studies... There's a lot of incredible research in the space of psychotherapy. It's a, it's, a, it's a new field. I mean, we've had this for the last 200 years. Compared to every other industry, this is a baby. It's an infant. Relationship psychotherapy, the last 100 years. But the problem is that without a structure to apply the knowledge to, we apply it to our own lives. That becomes the structure for the, the model. And even though that these spaces are new, they're only 100 to 200 years old, there's still a lot of wonderful knowledge that's coming out of them. Things that actually are true, they apply. But then it gets into the hands of a therapist who takes the pieces of it, applies it to their own life, and then spits it out as if that is the framework. And it's not. It's just the pieces that have applied to them. And those academic journals showed exactly that. That what was happening from these different studies was that therapists, counselors, psychotherapists, they were taking the academics, they were pulling it into their personal lives, applying it, and then spitting it back out in what basically became academic advice based on personal experiences. Not based on what the other person was going through, but based on the own therapist's experiences. And this was a huge piece of what lent itself to the inaccuracy and the ineffectiveness of the service. On top of that, once you get an LMFT, once you go and you get these different certificates, the ongoing education to maintain it is not that much. So a lot of the latest academics, a lot of the latest research, these people had no clue of. And I, I don't, want to say that this is, you know, the, the, it's very easy to interpret what we're saying as bashing of traditional counseling, of counselors, of, you know, marriage therapists, of family therapists. It, and it's not that at all. It's not their issue. It's not their fault. It's the fact that there's never been a structure to apply this knowledge to. This is what made the stupid, simple relationship method so powerful. Because it's a structure for how a healthy relationship should operate. We've taken the thousands of possible human behavioral interactions and we've condensed it down into three simple pieces, desire, quality time, and sustainability, and with 10 components total inside of this framework. That sounds a little bit complicated, but it's definitely better than 10,000, 100,000 possible human interactions and behaviors. It's actually usable. And when we applied and when we took all the different academics and all the different models and applied it to it, then Dr. Glenn found that, well, the stupid, simple relationship method actually already accounted for each of these different academic 
therapy models. They're all built into it. All we had to do was create basically a treatment program, an actual therapy program, which became CVFT or what we call core value focused therapy. We did the smart thing and trademarked these. And, you know, we have our, <laughs> our submissions into every patent library and place that we need to be. But the goal is that we can now bring this out in terms of the actual framework and then apply everything that we're learning, all the academics to it. And it's not to say that what we know is, is, is perfect. It's far from that. But it's a much better place than what we had, and it continues to improve each and every day. Science is, is only right in so much as what we know right now, right? The science changes on everything all the time. So part of being a scientist, part of being an academic is admitting to, I know what I know right now, but that's going to change when I learn something better tomorrow. That once I've proven that this is not true or that there is a better way, I'm going to accept that way. This is what makes this project with Dr. Glenn so fun for, oh, I'm, I'm going to say for both of us, but I'm going to speak for me because my career has focused on, I want to say practical academia. I want to say taking the research and the science and studying and, and simplifying it into frameworks that could be applied to everyday life. And if it couldn't be applied, I just left it out. I've been doing this for the past 20 years, I've done this in the space of learning languages I've done it in the space of photography and creativity, how to learn lighting, how to learn all these different aspects of taking a photograph and delivering a, a photo to a client. Then I applied it to the business of running a photography studio of how do you keep clients happy, the, the psychology of sales and, and each of these different components until eventually it led five years ago to that this research project for relationships and to today where now it's kind of on a broader level. But my focus has always been practical application of academia. If it can't be learned, adopted, and implemented in a short period of time, I don't want it. And on Glenn's side, that's the beautiful aspect is his 20 years has been in academia. It's been in the science of it, in the clinical setting, in the environment, and now teaching as a professor. So I get to not only you know, read all the books that are put out by our peers, but then I get to bring the concepts and ideas straight to Dr. Glenn and to have him not only weigh in on them, but then I get to challenge him and those concepts. How does this apply? In some cases, I win those challenges. In other cases, I lose them. No matter the outcome, though, what we bring into the actual framework, into our structure, into our programs, into core value-focused therapy, it's only the things that work and the things that work quickly and effectively. Otherwise it has no business being part of what we do. Now the result of all this was CVFT, core value focused therapy. And it's a process where we get to turn you, the client into your own relationship expert. See in our minds, we're not really providing a solution when that solution requires your subscription fee. You know, traditional counseling among those studies, what we found was that couples who were in traditional counseling, they found it to be effective so long as they, were, as they were going. And think about that. The reason why they found it to be effective as long as they were going was because it was the painkiller. Because each week they could go sit down in a relatively safe space. I say relatively because it's really not because they, the relationships still end up, you know, ending. But in that space, they could vent share their frustrations. They could be open. They could, they could do whatever they wanted to do in that space. And so they have a temporary pain relief that kind of begins to fade as soon as they walk out of that office until the next week when they can go back and do it again. So what you have in that traditional model was a subscription service. It's a painkiller that's as effective to a certain extent as long as you're actually paying for it and going to it. This, in our opinion, is not a solution. It's not fixing anything. So maybe it's crazy. Maybe it's a bad business move, but we designed a 12-week program. And the goal of that 12-week program, the goal of this platform, this podcast, whether you become a client or not, whether you're just listening, the goal is to turn you into your own relationship expert. For you to be able to say, this is what's going wrong in my relationship. And this is how I can actually address it. Now, at least, see, 
having the ability to, to diagnose an issue that that is the first step right you can choose how you want to look for a solution maybe you diagnose the issue and maybe you say this is a core value problem this is a relatability problem this is a, a common interest problem we're going to get into all this stuff as we go through the entire platform right but you you diagnose and say this is the area of issue we're having well you can choose any solution you want you can come back to us and visit with us and, and speak to a professional to get guidance you can go to someone else you can go to another psychotherapist you can go to anybody to get guidance you can go to a coach you could just pick up books on that particular subject, but having the ability to diagnose is what gives you the power to be able to address the issue however you want to do it. And that's the purpose, is that we want you to walk away with, number one, the ability to diagnose your own issues. Number two, with enough tools to be able to address them on their own. And number three, if you want to seek additional help to know exactly where to go and what to look for. And the power in this is knowing what's right for you, being able to diagnose and choose the right solution for you. Because I'm going to close with this. There is no one single piece of advice that is always right. In fact, when it comes to relationship advice, so often it's presented to us in the form of absolutes, right? Marriage is all about compromise and, you know, marriage is all about communication and never go to bed angry and good friends never do this and bad it's always absolute. Well, the only absolute is that no one piece of advice is always right. That is the only accurate absolute that we've ever come across. We would encourage you not only to question any advice that's presented as an absolute, but to question the person that's giving it. Because any professional that's worth their salt is going to know that there is no one size fits all when it comes to relationship advice. Now, we started this journey going to answer the question of what does a healthy relationship look like this was kind of a, a background on just that question the importance of it next week we're going to start the process of diving into it we're going to spend a bit of time on it and we're going to apply it to your everyday life and we're going to have a good time doing it too so i'll see you guys next time in the meantime though if you'd like to help us out we would love for you to hop onto the itunes store you can leave a review for the podcast we always say it's nice if it's a five-star review. We do read every single one of them. Uh, if you have any critique, though, it would be great if you just DM'd us that critique. You can find us on Instagram. You can also find us on TikTok. This is kind of our social media platform where we get to bring you shorts. See, on the podcast, it's all about these long-form conversations, about diving deep into these concepts and, well, in these roadmaps, probably also helping put you to sleep. Tell me if you're actually using these to fall asleep. Be nice to know. But in short form, we're going to bring you ideas, concepts. So on social media, on Instagram and TikTok, we're going to bring you these bite-sized concepts and ideas that you can immediately put into practice. And if you like, you can share with your friends. We have also the TWR Roadmap. That's our newsletter, which is what this episode is. You can sign up for the newsletter at 12weekrelationships.com. Last but not least, if you like personal or relationship coaching, you can join our wait list. If you are local in the area, we are going to reach out. We do have quite a few people and Dr. Glenn's schedule is pretty full, but we'll reach out as soon as there's openings and availability. And if you're outside of the area, international, what we're going to do is save your name on that wait list. And when we have the online programs available, we'll let you know. That's it for me. See you guys next time.